Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to our next story. Now, our next story is an interesting one. And it actually ties into another story that I've been researching. So you're kind of getting a double header here. Ah, ah, no pun intended. We're going back to the year 1984. And there's a young woman, she's unnamed, because all of the information about this story is from a medical paper, and they don't reveal the patient's name for privacy reasons. We're in the year 1984, we're in Britain. There's a young woman sitting there reading a book. Just reading a book, hanging out, not really thinking of anything. And then she hears a voice. Not from the corner of her room, not from her closet, but from inside her own head. Please don't be afraid. Yeah, and let me stop there. Whenever something tells you don't be afraid or don't panic, pretty much you're going to be afraid or panic, but you're sitting there reading the book. Please don't be afraid. I know it must be shocking for you to hear me speaking to you like this, but this is the easiest way I could think of. My friend and I used to work at the Children's Hospital, Great Ormond Street, and we would like to help you. And she is startled. Startled, obviously. That's the direct quote that the, uh, the patient said that the voice said. Now, the patient knew of that children's hospital. She was aware of it, but she had never been there. She had children. Her children had never been there. And then, that wasn't it. Then the voices said, To help you see that we are sincere, we would like you to check out the following. And then at that point, the medical paper goes on to say that the patient was given three separate pieces of information that the patient didn't know about already, and she went and looked it up, and the things were true. Now, we don't know what those things were. It's not listed. It might be things that were too private. It might be things that would lead more to her being revealed. But at this point, first she thinks she's hearing voices, so she's incredibly startled. Then the voices tell her things that she doesn't know, and she looks them up, and they're they're true. So she went to the doctor. She immediately was put down her book after she got done researching it, because first you probably think it's your imagination or something like that. She ends up going to the doctor. Doc, she sees the doctor. She's in a complete state of panic, and the doctor says, this is a little bit out of my specialty. You need to go see a specialist. So she ends up going to this psychologist or psychiatrist, one of the two. I always get them confused. But she ends up going to see this person. And they're having, they're having this debate because the person who's writing this paper says, what you are experiencing is a functional hallucinatory psychosis. And we can do counseling. I'm going to put you on some medication. But this is just something that happens to people sometimes. And we will take care of it. And she started taking it, taking the medicine, going to the counseling. And she felt better. She was like, okay, I don't, I'm not afraid of the voices coming back. It doesn't specify if the voices were constant through this time period, but it, just hearing it once or twice would be bad enough. She takes the medication, she goes out onto a holiday, which is what they call a vacation in England. Now, she was on the drugs, she was on holiday, and the voices came back. And this time, we don't have the direct quote, but the voices told her she's in the sunny, sunny beaches of wherever is not England. And these voices say, you immediately have to take action. You are in danger. You need to have treatment right now. And they gave her an address. She goes back to England and she's totally panicking. Her husband's like, listen, we have this address. I'm telling you, it's not going to lead anywhere. Everyone is still under the impression that she is just having a mental breakdown, a temporary mental breakdown. Husband puts her in the car because they're not going to let her drive. They're driving through England. They follow the address, and it was a department of, it was basically a brain scan department for a major London hospital. She goes back to the specialist, and she goes, the voices are back. They told me to go in there and get a brain scan. As the car is pulling, this is so bizarre, as the car is pulling up to the brain scan building, just a giant building in the shape of a brain, No, because, you know, like, they have, like, separate, they have the hospital, but then they have the separate buildings for specialty stuff. At least they do in America. As she's pulling up to the brain scan place, the voices come back and they say, you need to go in there and you need to have a brain scan done. For two reasons. You have a tumor and your brain stem is inflamed. Now imagine, again, you're in a car. You're driving, you, you hope... Your hope is that this address is to like a meatpacking factory 
or a, a field or a playground or something that you can just be like, you're right, I am just going crazy, I just need to take more medicine. But as you're turning the corner and you see the building and it's it's shaped as a giant brain and it's glowing, Dr. Wiley's famous brain palace, as you're driving around the corner and you see it and you see what it is, you the voices come back and say, go inside. You have a brain tumor and your brain stem's inflamed. And her heart just sunk because she wants to prove that it's fake so she can be treated for it. But in her heart, she knows that it's not fake. She freaks out. Her husband takes her back to the specialist. And the specialist is like, listen, it is all in your head. There's a chance that maybe at some point you had looked at, you had seen an ad for this place. And that information was stored in your brain. And your delusion is building off of that information. But he's like, nothing's talking to you. Nothing's talking to you. There's rational explanations for this. However, to allay your fears... I will schedule you an appointment. I will give you a referral to have your brain checked to this place. And your brain's going to come back and it's going to be 100% fine. And then we can get past the delusion. Psychiatrist, sorry, the specialist calls up the brain people. They're just floating brains there at Dr. Wiley's brain palace. And he goes, I need to get her brain checked out. And they go, well, what's her symptoms? like?" And he goes, well, she has none. And they're like, well, we can't check her out. And he's like, listen, I know that this is, this is weird, but she's hearing these voices and they directed her to your place. And that went back and forth for like two months. The brain scan people are like, we're not, that's a waste of time. She's not showing any signs. Her regular doctor's not saying there's any problem. But finally, the specialist was able to say, please just help this woman. It will help her on a path to recovery. So they say, fine, we'll give her a brain scan. It's covered by insurance because it was a referral from the psychologist, psychiatrist guy. I actually think it might have been a woman. But anyways, that's quibbling at this point, (laughs) 10 minutes into the story. The patient is then taken to the brain scan place. They're like, put her in the machine. Mother brain is sitting back there doing the taxes. It's the whole place is populated by brain people, famous brain people. Pinky and the brain are in the back. She gets her brain scanned. She has a tumor. She has a tumor in her brain. Brainstem's inflamed because of the tumor. She showed absolutely no symptoms of this. So now now the husband and the specialist and the brain people are like, oh, okay, this is kind of spooky. This is a little spooky now. And the brain people said, you know what, here's the thing. Right now you're not showing any symptoms. And it may not cause any damage, but it's your call. Should we, we can go in and operate now and take it out. Because, you know, brain, brain surgery is not something you necessarily want to go through just for, you know, just for giggles. They go, we can go in and take it out now or we can wait till it's symptomatic. The voices in her head returned and said, take it out now. Take it out now. Take it out now. Now, they may not have chanted, but the woman said, oh, yeah, no, the voices in my head are saying we should take it out now. So they should take it out now. So they did. They took it out now. And after the procedure is done, after she wakes up, She hears one final message from the voices. We are pleased to have helped you. Goodbye. Hasn't heard the voices since. Now, again, this woman's identity is private to the public, but she has actually gone with the specialist to conventions and seminars to be interviewed by other psychologists, psychiatrists, people. Like, it is a known case in that community. Because they've really tried to figure out what caused it. And some of the theories are that the brain was talking to itself in a sort of self-healing fashion. That all the information that she said she didn't know, she actually knew on some sort of subconscious level. One of the things, one of the debunking things was that it was all a scam that she wanted to get. Because it was in England. She wanted to get free health care because she had only moved there like 7 to 10 years ago. But in England, you, she did already have a free medical care through their national health system. So people were trying to say, well, maybe it's just a scam because she wanted a brain scan and she knew she couldn't pay for it. Maybe she already knew she had a tumor, but then people are like, no, she had free health insurance. The psychiatrist was like, she came to me. It was free. It was all covered. So it, it wasn't a scam. Could have been ghosts. Could have been a future self talking to her. What's interesting is that when you look at the original voice, when you look at what the original voice said, first off, 
It's one voice, but it speaks as if there's two of them. It says, my friend and I, refers to itself, my friend and I used to work at Children's Hospital Great Ormond Street, and we would like to help you. That's an interesting part of it, because it's identifying itself as a particular entity or group of entities. It's not like, we are your brain. It's not just a voice saying, go to the doctor. It's specifying that there's two of us in here, and this is where we used to work. So that kind of leads you at like a ghost angle. Or maybe even a angel slash miracle angel, where they're like, yeah, we used to quote-unquote work at the hospital because we're angels and we're like doing miracles on st- and stuff like that. But they never really could come up with a reasonable answer for this. But I think I have in my... <laughs> Four hours researching this. I think it came up with a reasonable angle. And it actually ties into another story that was a recommendation. So a couple, I don't know, probably a couple weeks ago, months ago, or something like that. I got a recommendation on YouTube from Rusty Shackelford. Rusty Shackelford said, hey, have you ever heard of bicameralism? And I hadn't. And we're going to go over it fairly briefly. It's, It's quite a fascinating topic, but it's a little outside of my ability to explain. Because it gets pretty deep, actually. But what it is, is that up until maybe a couple thousand years ago, through the whole course of human, human history, up until a couple thousand years ago, humans had absolutely no sense of introspection. They never asked why. They simply did things. And they did things because their brain was telling them to do things. They heard voices all the time. Time to wake up. Get up. Go. Wake up. And they would actually hear that voice. And they go, oh, get up. It's time to go to work. You got to go out to work. You have to work this long. Don't. Yeah. He called them. So there was a psychologist called Julian Jaynes. And this was back in 1979. He wrote this book. Sorry. Yeah. Back in 1976, the year I was born. I was born. I was born, I was coming out of my mother's womb as this book was being published. The book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. And the, his theory was, was that there was just no, there was no why. One side of the brain told the other side of the brain to, what to do. And people just did things. And he called them noble aut- automatons. Not robots. They were human. But th- they would hear voices to compelling them to do things. And that is why they did things. They didn't do things because they're like, oh, what a beautiful sunny day. You know what? I feel like I should go fly a kite. They would hear a voice in their head saying, it's time to relax. You should go out and invent a kite and then fly it. Like a little caveman out there flying a kite. It was all voices. And it's interesting because the theory plays into a lot of different things. There's always that question of how come in religions, how come when we look back in early history, God is constantly talking to people and people are constantly getting visions and messages from angels and communications with gods? Jane's theory was that they weren't. It was their brain telling them stuff, and that's how they they had no concept of what was going on. So if you asked someone... Why did, you, why did you go up there and write those Ten Commandments? He's like, uh, God told me to? Because he just hears a voice in his head saying, walk up the mountain. Stay up here. Write these things down. Go down the mountain. It was all, but you would hear it as clearly as the patient did with the tumor. Full on, just sitting there next to a burning bush, and you would hear a voice saying, this is what is going on. And you would simply do it. Julian Jaynes' theory, one of the things that he uses to back this up, is when we look at super, super early literature, and he's talking about the Iliad and the oldest parts of the Old Testament. Let me, here, let me read this quote to you here from this article. The characters of the Iliad do not sit down and think out what to do. They have no conscious minds such as we say we have, and certainly no introspections. It is impossible for us, with our subjectivity, to appreciate what it was like. And the same thing with the earliest books of the Bible. Characters simply did things. But when we look at the Odyssey, 
versus newer parts of the Bible, Ecclesiastes on, characters do start, well, not characters in the Bible, but, you know, there's people in the Bible and characters in the Odyssey. We see them start to go, why? They start to question, they start to become introspective. There's a whole ton of debate on this subject. There's a ton, obviously, this was a super controversial book. And James has been described as either mad or a genius or both. Like, he is either 100% right or 100% wrong. And either way, it redefines things. Because no one's out, out and saying this guy's a fraud or a crackpot. There's just a lot of debate over whether or not what he says is true. And really, a lot of the debate comes around his term, noble automatons. People are like, are you saying that we were robots back then? And James was like, no, 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 no. I'm not saying that they were robots. If your brain was telling you to do something, you would do it. Because that's all you knew. As a baby, it would be like, you're hungry. Crawl. Go outside. Stick a fork in that electrical outlet. But as you got older, till the field. It's time to go home. You're hungry. And, and all the way up, your children would do that. Their grandchildren would do that. It would go on and on and on. And at some point in fairly recent human history, the human brain connected. And the way we are, how we can have internal dialogues and go, do I really want, I really want to eat that Dairy Queen, but I got to watch my diet. It's not good for me. But, you know, I want that. No, Jason, you know, it's not good. Just walk on by the place and da-da-da-da-da. That didn't, his theory is that didn't happen before. You would just walk by Dairy Queen, caveman-style Dairy Queen, where they all, it's like soft-serve rocks. And a voice would either say, keep walking, you're not hungry, or go inside and eat some Dairy Queen, you deserve it. That was it. There was no introspection, there was no why should I or why shouldn't I, you simply did things. And the only way you could describe that was, God's talking to me. I think that's what happened with the tumor. I think that might actually be a case of a bicameral mind. Not saying that she is like a throwback to the Neanderthals, but what if that tumor separated her mind back to that basic level of a noble automaton, and it set her back to where her body was now, her brain was basically now in control of her, rather than the other way around. Her brain was commanding her to do things. She was hearing voices. And you could say they were voices from God or voices from an angel or someone who's having other evil delusions could say, I hear demons in my head or something like that. What if these are all cases? What if this is all proof of Jane's theory of a bicameral mind? I think it's fascinating to think because evolution is supposed to take place over millions of years. But if we can look at something, if Jane's theory is correct, you can tell I'm pretty excited about this because I just find this fascinating. If Jane's theory is correct, we had a major leap in human evolution within the past 6,000 years, 7,000 years, probably 5,000 years, somewhere around there. But you know what I mean? To go from a level where everyone simply heard voices telling them what to do to being where we are right now, where I can actually debate and I have control over what we do, where my essence like i have both sides of my brain but my essence of who i am i if a voice tells me to go out and run i can say you know what now i'm too tired what's the point and they didn't have that back then they just simply did and what i think is even more fascinating about that is most religious people do have the question is how come god seems more in people in human affairs thousands of years ago than they are today. Why is it 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 seemed like everyone would pray and something would happen, but today everyone can pray and it doesn't seem to affect things? Why is it back in the time you had all these prophets and you don't have them now? Maybe there's an evolutionary reason for that. And maybe the old way, maybe by having the ability to ask why and to be introspective and be able to make decisions for ourselves, That sounds like a great thing, but what if that evolution of the human mind cut us off from something greater, something more spiritual? This patient's mind, this tumor may have regressed her brain pattern to that of someone living 6,000 years ago, but that tapped her in to that voice in your head. And who's to say that that voice in your head doesn't come from somewhere else. 
what if now everyone's running on cable? Everyone's running on, our brains are strapped into a metaphorical coax cable that's going into a wall so we can get the programming we want. When our brains were originally designed to have rabbit ear antennas to pick up the signals that the universe wants us to have. That was a clip from our daily podcast, Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is available anywhere that you listen to podcasts. It's daily paranormal, conspiracy, and true crime news. If you want to hear the full episode that this clip came from, check the link below. Please like and subscribe. And hit that little bell, too. That does some magical stuff. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys.